for this podcast, we're proud to partner with Zurich Life and Investments. As one of the last true independent life insurers, Zurich has always believed in the value of advice and the professionals who provide it. They continue to invest in programs such as this one that are designed to strengthen the health and reputation of the advice profession. They're excited about the chance to partner with us, XY Advisor, to help shape the future direction of advice and help make it more accessible to more Australians. To find out more or to check out some of the latest advisor support tools, visit the website or ask your Zurich BDM. We all know education is one of the biggest things in the industry at the moment. It's why we've created the XY Advisor platform. It allows advisors to do short four-week courses. And what we're really keen to do is to get as many awesome content providers in there. So if you're an advisor or a service provider who have put together an awesome solution which can affect change in the way an advisor does their job on a Monday morning, please do put together an application for us at www.xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? You're not too bad for Friday afternoon. Yeah, Friday <laughs> afternoon. You've uh, you, you've been dogged in by your, your colleagues <laughs> for, for several reasons, actually. One of them is you're the Walking Corporations Act, I believe. That's allegedly me, yes. <laughs> and, and, and that's because you've worked in law since you finished uh, university? Uh, yeah, 15 years experience in financial services regulation. Which we were talking about just before we, we went uh, live, that that's literally since the beginning of existence, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, certainly since the beginning of the uh, implementation of AFS licensing. Right, yes. right. <laughs> I don't know if that counts quite as, as the beginning of existence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, uh, uh, I love superfluous. <laughs> uh, I'm completely millennial. Um, so, so not only uh, are you, uh, you know, Walking Corporations Act, but uh, another thing, you write uh, adult fantasy. Is is, is yes. that is that e- how? Is epic that? fantasy. Epic fantasy. Yep. So like Lord of the Rings stuff. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> that is awesome. So, and you've got four books published. I have four books presently published. Yes. That's insane. Tell me, um, lead me through it. I, I want to know. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. So I've written fantasy fiction since I was actually 13. Um, wow. Got serious in sort of 2007, published my first book in 2013. Two of them are self-published, two are published with a small press in the U.S., um, and it's all save the world from evil monsters stuff. Really? Yeah. What, it, uh, what's the, who's the protagonist? Oh, there's two series. Um, one of them, <laughs> um, the protagonist is a wizard uh, who's on the run after being framed for demon summoning, mm. and uh, the other one, the protagonist, is uh, a woman who is the chosen avatar of the death goddess, um, and she's got to defeat the um, evil priestess who's trying to destroy the world. Really? In, oh, in a nutshell. <laughs> my God, that sounds awesome. How do you even come up with that? Uh, inspiration particles floating through the air. Really? Um, well, that's Terry Pratchett's idea, so I can't claim that. But oh, that whole know, concept just, of, of the yeah. things exist and you we sort of reach up into You're the ether the and grab them. You're just the recipient of it. It hits you and it's good. So, yeah, I mean, stuff just comes to me. You just Anything can inspire you. A song, something you see in real life, news, um, anything, absolutely anything. Do you know the entire story before you start? Not the entire story. I know the whole of the book that I'm about to write, but I right. don't know the whole story. I know where it's going to end ultimately, yep. Yep. the series, but I couldn't tell you like all the nitty gritty. So w- would you sit down and say, okay, so over the next X amount of months, I'm going to write this book and this is how it ends and this is how it starts. Do you then chart, you know, character journeys and growths? And because and, there's yep. the, 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 so you know what yes. chapter you're going to be hitting certain points. Yep. I know what's happening in what chapter and who it's happening to. Yep. There'll be stuff that I'll add along the way. Way, but yes. that's that's the roadmap that I have. And then that person uh, is, is you know uh, betrays that person, and then sometimes yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so would you even say something like you know chapter thirteen character X betrays character Y? I'd probably be more specific, and I'd actually say how they betray them. Really? Yeah. So you know, um, parents turn out not to be parents and betray her to the evil priestess and give her up as a hostage or something like that. That's so mad. How old were you when you read uh, Lord of the Rings for the first time? Um, 11. <laughs> I don't even know if I could read at 11. <laughs> My God. That's impressive. Okay, so what? So how does all of this then... Okay, oh, wait, one more thing. And you're a bit of a, a karaoke fiend? Yes, sometimes. Yeah, It's okay. been a while since I hit the karaoke circuit, but I have been known to make the rounds. Have you ever been on, like, uh, Idol? Or, or, God, or, no. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> I've had people tell me I should, but no. Really? I've never gone there. Ah, oh, that's yeah. so awesome. 
Um, yeah, I mean, there is definitely a, a link between being creative, being, uh, you know, enjoying singing and then um, this concept of grabbing inspiration from places. So I understand how all that works, but then how does that work with being a walking corporations act? <laughs> That's, that is actually my genuine question. So you've got this very creative part of yourself. Now, uh, what's going on here? What, what, do you love it? Do you love it as much as Gandalf? What's going on? <laughs> Um, I'm actually one of those people who is both left and right brain. Um, mm. So that's that's why the switch between both. So the, I've got the creative side going on, and then I've got the very analytical, very structured, very sort of mathematical slash scientific side. Do you argue with yourself happening. a lot? I have been known to talk to myself <laughs> and possibly <laughs> tell myself off. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, Okay, so uh, on on that on that left brain side of things, you uh, you been in financial services law since, you know, what, last 15 years. Yep. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the XY group and something that is becoming exponentially more uh, of a talked about topic, it's becoming really quite at the surface of what advisors are concerned about, what they should be thinking about. So I definitely would like your opinion on whether you agree with the the trend of self licensing and mm-hmm. and um, and people you know th- there are articles coming out even just very recently where it's almost like self licensing is 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 almost on its way to becoming kind of mandatory um, maybe I mean I'm paraphrasing there but it, it's becoming very topical um, if you think about it it makes sense the advisor is ultimately responsible anyway so you you can't technically punt the responsibility mm. to to a dealer group. So um, there's there's that, um, and and advisors are understandably a little bit concerned. And so because this concept is coming up where we might be needing to self license, um, it's very topical and it's very awesome to have you on to chat about uh, this this topic in particular. So first of all, what's what's your opinion? Do you think or, or do you see this becoming a bigger topic? Do you th- see this um, coming up more? Is it a trend or is it just a flash in the pan? Uh, look, so we, y- y- when licensing first started in 2004, you think, okay, like a whole bunch of people are going to get licensed. And then you would expect that your licensing numbers would sort of fall off after that, which they do, right? But you kind of think, okay, well, everyone's going to get licensed up front that wants to get licensed and then ongoing you'll have very sort of low numbers of licensing. But what ASIC has seen is that they've had consistent sort of numbers of licensing year on year on year. And I think actually at the moment the number of licensing that they're doing every year is growing, mm-hmm. um, although I couldn't cite you numbers off the top of my head. And I do think that um, in the financial advice space, specific to sort of financial um advice businesses as distinct to some of the other areas of financial services law that is being driven as you say by this pressure point between individual advisor obligations and dealer group obligations Um, because I know personally I see a lot of advisors who run into trouble uh, with the regulator um, for having done the wrong thing but what they say to me is but I just did what my licensee told me to do I couldn't do it any other way uh, and there's this regulatory trend of pushing more and more obligations down onto the individual advisor, like this is somehow going to fix these cultural problems that have now, of course, been exposed in the Royal Commission. But it's it's not. Mm. <laughs> and so advisors get caught between a rock and a hard place. So on the one hand, you've got the best interest duty, which is my own personal obligation and I have to comply. And on the other hand, I've got my licensee who's got obligations to monitor and supervise me, telling me that the advice that I want to give is actually wrong and that I should be saying something else. And I look at their advice and I actually think that that's wrong. So well, what, what do I do? Do I take a punt that the licensee knows better than me and run with their advice and take a risk that I personally will be in breach of my obligation? Do I stick to my guns? And if I do stick to my guns, to what extent can I actually do that? So what's the alternative? Well, the obvious alternative is self-licensing. So I do think that that's certainly driving it. And a lot of the financial advisors who come to us and who are looking for a new license, one of the things that they give as a reason is their dealer group. It might not necessarily be articulated in that way. You know, my dealer group won't allow me to act compliantly because that's not necessarily something that 
they're able to express in that fashion. But it'll be the culture is not a good fit for me or I'm not getting enough support from my dealer group, however you interpret that. Um, or I feel that I'm paying more for the services than what I'm actually getting back, um, which is another way of saying lack of support. Uh, so, yeah, definitely there is something in the dealer groups which is driving a lot more um, advisors to think about getting their own licence. Yeah. Is it difficult to do? Uh, I guess it depends on your definition of difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, the ASIC licensing process is not easy. Yeah. Um, but when I say it's not easy, I don't mean um, only a few select people can get a licence. I actually mean that the process is challenging um, in, just in the level of bureaucracy that, that but, you... But that's where someone like yourself or yeah. a colleague or, or, or to that extent can help. Absolutely. Right. Um, is it worth doing in your opinion? Uh, well, that's actually a funny question because um, if you if you look across various different financial services industries, you see different patterns. So the thing in financial advice is that not many people have their own license and a lot of people leverage the dealer groups. But if you go and you look at a different industry like general insurance broking, for example, everybody has their own license, or very nearly everybody. And that's a big deal, you know, like to have your own license is kind of like, it's a status symbol almost. It's just what you do. Um, so I think if you look across industries and just sort of habits in the way that people do things, the fact that so many businesses in general insurance, including small businesses, have a license sort of indicates on one level that um, having it is worthwhile. And it's there's an upfront expense, but ongoing the expense is maybe not that high. Uh, and there's nothing that a dealer group is doing that you can't do for yourself. Um, I mean, I guess the distinct difference with general insurance is that they have a cut down best interest obligation, uh, but you could almost argue that that's a more compelling reason for financial advisors to look at it because, again, we have this issue of how they have that obligation themselves versus the dealer group's perspective on it and what they think that they should be doing. So you think that it's a legitimate thing to, to look into? Absolutely. I don't think licenses are just for large businesses. I think anybody can have a license. Um, do you get a lot of questions for, uh, I'm not sure if a co-op is the right word, um, but say a group of five planners that, that want a dealer group just for themselves? Uh, not often. So we'll have a couple of people who might come to us who have connections who might want a license that will do several different things. Um, but usually what happens is that they'll say, okay, well, we own a company together jointly um, and we want to do ABC um, and then how can we make that work? And so then we'll give them some advice about, okay, well, you can get all the authorizations that you want at this top level in this company that will hold the license and then you can actually have separate business units underneath, which is basically a mini dealer group. So it does happen, um, but it's usually very closely held Group. So it might be a family or um, former business partners uh, who have slightly different business models. We don't usually get sort of um, a group of five independent businesses that come and say, well, we just want to share a license. Uh, I have done that for a completely unrelated industry uh, mm. where licensing recently came into charitable fundraising. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and I had a couple of clients come to me and they said, well, we need a license and there's, there's two of us and we want to share costs and, and well, split yeah, that. Well, yeah, because that's what I'm uh, – because yeah. I know I, I've got some friends that just built their own little um, – their own little, and they don't accept anyone in. It's not a it's public a thing. Group. Yep. Very much so. But uh, I've never – I haven't spoken to anyone about this. No one, at least to my knowledge, uh, is doing it. Um, what do you think are some pros or cons to, to doing, say, a group of four or five, you know, same sort of alignment as far as mm -hmm. uh, culture is concerned, but for whatever reason, they just don't want to combine their businesses? Uh, I think that it would be better for it if it's a closely held group. Um, and close, I think, is better. If you open it, then you just start moving into the same territory as the dealer groups. Yeah. And, of course, there's the risk of what kind of advisors you're going to attract because you're new on the scene and, you know, is this a softer option than maybe some of the other dealer groups that are out there? Um, but, yeah, absolutely there are advantages to doing it that way um, for people who feel that they are aligned because you can reduce costs. Mm. If you've got four or five people who want to maintain their separate businesses and separate branding um, and share a licence, I mean, now you're talking about if, if you're going to engage a consultant to help you, you're talking about splitting, say, the $25,000 cost um, four or five ways yeah, instead, of, instead of each of you having it's that nothing. cost separately. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's so a low. Lot, it's a lot smaller. What's the ongoing cost? 
Having a license? Oh, look, that's really, really hard to say. It ultimately depends on how many advisors you have. Um, I mean, things that you need to think about is like your PO insurance cost, yep. um, which is probably the biggest one. Uh, there's the EDR membership cost. What's um, that? It's only a few hundred dollars a year. Oh, what is it, EDR? Oh, so the external dispute resolution. Um, right. So FOS, which is Financial right. Ombudsman Service, or the Credit yes. in, uh, Investment Ombudsman, yes. which has now been replaced by, of course, AFCA, which is the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, I think. Don't quote <laughs> me. Everyone keeps calling it AFCA in all the media releases. Right. Um, so, and I don't know what their annual fees are going to be, but I would imagine that it would be in the same order as what has been charged to date. Yep. Um, there's your... Compliance costs. Um, yeah, and you can get someone. You can you can pay f- these people to come in, right? Yeah, how much so does you, that cost? Oh, look, if you're going to get an external order, I mean, we would probably say again, it's it's driven by how many advisors, right? Sure. Um, but let's say there's an advisor cost of two to three thousand dollars if you do a full wow, external it's so audit. Small. Um, I mean, it, it probably starts, it, it, it changes depending on like where you are in terms of scalability and how many offices you've got and whether you want someone to come on site or whether you're going to do it remotely, things like that. Um, but I mean, if you've got four or five advisors, you might be looking at $10,000 for an external audit. Goodness gracious. It doesn't need to be every year. <laughs> yeah, um, right. It's, um, it's every sort of few years. Um, that's a full external audit. I'm not talking about like just compliance support. So compliance support is generally quite a lot cheaper. Mm. Um, so you just get somebody who comes in once a month or once every two months to sort of help you with various sorts of compliance checks that need to be done. The alternative, of course, is that you hire somebody, but most small businesses won't do that. Uh, They won't hire a dedicated compliance manager. Totally. They'll actually wait until they've got enough scale to justify having a part-time resource and then eventually build up to a full-time resource. Yeah. I mean, technically, if if, let's go back, and I don't know why I'm stuck on this five business, but I just am, but (laughs) theoretically, if you had five... You could probably pay for someone part time to, to work that. Yeah, potentially, for you. if you had five businesses, it would become more um, cost effective to hire somebody. And then, uh, what, what are the what are the risks? What are the dangers? What uh, what kind of protection do yeah. you have as an? Adv- and then we'll get to the protection for the the <laughs> client. But what kind of protection do you have as an advisor? The risk of that kind of model is the same as the risk of any other business partnership arrangement. Um, are you going to have a falling out? Uh, who gets to keep the license and who loses out if you all decide to go your separate ways. Um, it, what happens, you know, some of you still got a license, some of you don't have a license. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you do in the meantime? How quickly can you find somebody else to appoint Feel you so spot. that you can carry on? And what about just as a sole practicing practice? practitioner as someone who who has their own license what what's the risk there what what is in the risk uh, like let's say a, a client wants to sue an advisor and they got their own license is there anything is there any benefits that come with being say an AMP that you don't get with being uh, self-licensed that's a really interesting question like um, like would AMP hire a lawyer at their expense to defend the advisor and- I'm not 100% sure of that I think it depends upon the model, I understand that some of, if we use AMP as an example, and I mm. imagine it's correct across most of the dealer groups, um, some of the advice businesses tend to come within what they call sort of the core group. Um, and so then the legal counsel for the dealer group will actually provide advice to those businesses and other businesses are not part of that core group and they are responsible for engaging their own legal counsel. Um, so I would assume, although I don't know, that it would depend upon that Right. Um, so I guess the risk of having uh, your own license is is there's no there's no one to fall back on if if you get into trouble. You've got to say, "Hello, uh, my name is Advisor, and and I've got this problem. I need help." Well, that's true. But if you've got PI insurance, um, your oh, insurance will cover it, which right. you have to have PI insurance if you're yeah, dealing with retail okay. clients. Okay. And often your PI insurer will actually take that over. Oh, um, is so that how that works? They may engage a lawyer to actually defend the claim. Right. Yeah. Okay. Before, before they decide what the, how they want to, if they're going to pay the claim, if they're going to settle the claim, um, so they'll actually engage a lawyer to manage that okay. in so, a lot of cases. Right. So I guess then the question is for, for someone who's self-licensed is what kind of assistance do I get in whatever reason that I need it from my PI? Yep. Which goes to my next question, what kind of protections does the client get by dealing with someone who has their own license? So, for example, if you were to use, and, and I'm only using AMP here because they're just so big. Um, if if the client uh, sues an advisor, 
and and wins, there's this massive pool of money that they can go after. What kind of um, what kind of support or, or remediation does a, a client have if they're going after an, an advisor who just has their own license? Yeah, um, or is that a PI thing again? It, again, it comes back partly to PI. Right. Um, it, it also. Um, I mean, yes. If if because of the Corporations Act provisions actually say that the client can claim against the advisor, the authorised representative, if there's a, a corporate authorised representative in there, um, or the licensee in any one of them, they're all jointly and severally liable. So if the client, whoever the client claims against has to pay it and then sort out with the other parties who owes what. So yes, if you're dealing with a dealer group like AMP, there's the deep pockets thing that some clients like. Mm. Um but ultimately, it does come back to the PI insurance. I mean, that's why financial advisors are supposed to have PI insurance, um, because ASIC is concerned about protecting retail clients from loss. Uh, and ASIC mandates certain limits that you're supposed to have on your insurance based on how big your business is and who you're dealing with um, to try and make sure that people will have an adequate amount of PI insurance if there's a claim made. Yep. Um, so unless you're talking about a really big claim that actually well, exceeded the limits. let's talk Storm Financial. Mm-hmm. So um, I know for a fact a lot of clients – ended up with nothing out of that. And I always and I always questioned, you know, what's the better option for a client? Is it is it aligned or is it unaligned or non aligned, sorry. Um, purely based on and I'm not talking about conflicts here and AFSLs, but just from a, a remediation point of view, is the people that were like the clients of um, Storm Financial, there were a handful or whatever what the story was that just didn't get any money back. Mm. Um, and so is that was that a, an issue with the PI? Is is that what that issue was? I'm not 100 percent certain what happened in that particular example, but um, if we sort of break it down, uh, when there's an issue, there's a question over what caused that issue. So is it a product failure, or was it bad advice? Mm. Now these issues get muddled in some of the large dealer groups like AMP because they are both the advisor and right. the product issuer. Yes. Right. So if there's a problem whether it's advice or the product, same, that, same they, they, they will tend to pay it, yep, right? Yep, um, yep, and yep. so I am aware <laughs> that um, some of the large institutions have paid compensation for, for example, um, failure of structured products during the global financial crisis. Correct. Um, and it wasn't that there was necessarily a problem with the advice that was given. The advice that was given may have been perfectly sound, um, but because the product failed, then they may have tended to um, compensate the client anyway because it was their product. Um, or they had some involvement in the development of that product. Right. Um, when you split that back out and you look at somebody who is just an advisor and not a product issuer, if the advice is sound and the client makes a complaint to the advisor, well, what happens is that the advisor goes back and says, I'm sorry, but there's, I can't help you. I didn't actually do anything wrong. Um, the advice that I gave you was perfectly sound. It's just that there was a huge unanticipated downturn in the market and the product has failed. Um, and my PI insurer is not going to cover it because they also said that I haven't done anything wrong. If you've got a problem, you'll have to take it up with the product issuer, for example, who may no longer exist right. post product failure, depending upon what kind of product it Understood. is. Understood. So even though you're not answering the Storm Financial specifically, theoretically, that is what happened. Po- quite possibly, Theoretically, yes. or, or, or similar things. Or something similar to that, yep. Right. Yep. No, that makes sense. Because okay. there's always that distinction between who's given the advice versus has the product actually failed. Interesting. Okay. So if I just examine it, because, you know, in a perfect world, I think, you know, if we look at it almost naively, um, and it, everyone would have their own license and a completely open APL. That to me, you know, from 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 a uh, sort of a theoretical point of view, that that is almost the, the, the holy grail. But um, that's a really interesting point that you, 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 you lay out is that if you're, and as an advisor, giving good advice and then a product that you recommend goes bankrupt and the money's gone, then... There's no recourse. Right. And to make it more complicated, if we sort of, we look at like risky products versus sort of basic sound products. Yeah. If you've invested your client in the stock market, yep. ASX 200 or, you know, blue chip stocks or whatever, and the stock market crashes... There's no recourse. Totally, right? totally. It's just bad luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The advice yeah. that you've been given is sound. Yep. Um, and you're just unlucky enough to have invested when some global event causes a big stock market crash. But if you've invested your clients in, I don't know, let's say 
agri business, mm. <laughs> and maybe you should have known that that product wasn't 100% above board, Tim Corp. Um, or you had other reasons to believe that the product wasn't sound, mm. then there could be an issue with the advice that's been given. Or not. It depends on what's sort of publicly known um, and what was able to be publicly verified. You know, so But those riskier types of products are where the distinction becomes harder to sort of see because, yes, the product failed, but should the advisor have known that that was not an appropriate product? And have you put somebody with an appropriate risk appetite into that product? So if you start putting conservative investors into agribusiness... <laughs> <laughs> tax, Jamie. It's called tax rebates. I know, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, that's, that's where the regulator will start to look at it and say, hey, well, you know, this person's risk profile is grossly misaligned to that product. Yeah. Did you have a conversation with the client about that? Did you explain it to them? And did they openly and willingly and in full understanding of the risk accept that risk for the tax rebate? Yeah, for the, ta- <laughs> oh, the tax. I used to be a, uh, I used to be a tax accountant and, uh, and it was the most hilarious thing, the stories or concepts that people would do just simply to pay less tax. In the end, I ended up saying to this, this one client, I said, look, if if you ask your, your employer for a, a salary reduction, you're going to achieve your goal. It, it's just, it's amazing the, the effort that people go to, you know, if it's not negative gearing, you know, it, they'll, they're looking at things like Timber Corp. And then, um, and I, 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 one, one client said to me one day, they said, uh, what happens if I take a, a loan out at 5%? and then stick it in a term deposit for 4%. <laughs> that, one, that 1% can I claim as a tax deduction? I said, yes. I just, I'm not even going to correct you. Yep. Yes. That's exactly, you would nailed it. Well done. Why? <laughs> I should come to you for investment advice. Oh, anyway, tax, 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 tax. Best problem you can have. By the end of the uh, three years in tax accounting, my, my summary after that is, Pay as much tax as humanly possible. Um, do whatever you can to reduce it, but be super happy with every tax dollar you pay because it means you've made substantially more than what you've Absolutely. paid. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that was my uh, my learnings. Um, okay, so what, in your opinion, right? So, do you see many um, do you see many advisors get sued? Like, is that is that in your realm of financial law? Do you, do you, does that sort of stuff come across your table or through your office or through through the conversations at the bar? Um, we okay, so we don't go to court as such, um, but certainly we would see those disputes in the early stages. So when a client has made a complaint, um, and that complaint is perhaps tricky in the licensee. Complaint to... To the licensee. To the licensee. So the, the licensee's got a complaint and, and the client's saying that, you know, I lost X amount of dollars because you gave me bad advice or whatever the issue is. Um, and the licensee's like, well, I don't know what to do with it. So maybe they get legal advice. You know, has, has this claim got, really got legs? Um, should I settle it? Um, should I decline the complaint and tell them that, you know, we gave good advice and there's nothing wrong with it? Um, and so we'll often do a bit of work around that. So we might help with the liaison. Uh, We might review the advice file and offer an opinion on uh, whether we think the advice was in the client's best interest or not. And so therefore, whether they've got a basis to push back on the complaint, um, if we think they should settle it. Right. We may be involved potentially in settlement negotiations, um, although it's not something that we would sort of do as the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if it progressed to court, then we wouldn't see it. Yep. And Um, that's, that's another set of lawyers? Yeah, so we would refer that on to litigation specialists. And that is where PI are absolutely involved at that stage. Yeah, and it could be that the the PI insurer will step in. So we might actually say to the client, look, you know, you need to contact your PI insurer. Okay. Um, And at that point, the PI insurer may step in and so we would have no further involvement. Um, The only time that you would usually say that the PI insurer wouldn't step in would be if there was some allegation that meant that there was evidence of perhaps willful misconduct or something like that. What's an example of willful misconduct? Fraud. Fraud, your classic example. Uh, as in, because because having having been so in 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 it for so long, I, I and there's so many checks and balances. I can't even imagine how to commit <laughs> fraud. So, what is an exa- what, what is an example of fraud? Um, I haven't had, I think, any personal experiences of fraud in a financial advice context. I had mm. a couple in general insurance where. Um, the client actually paid because in general insurance, the broker will actually receive the premium and then they pay it to the insurer. Um, whereas financial planners don't do that, right? So the money goes direct to the product issuer. So in one instance, um, the client came in and paid in cash and the broker actually pocketed it and it was never seen again. (laughs) Um, I saw another one where 
uh, this person was actually operating as an authorised representative of a general insurance licensee and he was supposed to invoice you using the licensee system and unknown to the licensee, he was also parallel invoicing off his own system, so he was double charging the clients. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's definitely willful. Yeah. There's a lot of willfulness in, in that kind of misconduct. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> so so someone's clearly being a criminal. Yep. Oh, actually, I do have uh, a financial advice example with uh, an advisor who tried to uh, redirect um, life insurance claims money to his own account. Wow. So Is that's, that that's how you know advice. Adrian Patty? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 oh right, so that's insane, right? Yes. So, so they said uh, you're getting life insurance, or that family member is getting life insurance, but they tried to get it into Here, their own here's account. Your, here's your claim form. Um, you're entitled to a claim payout of X dollars, which was massively understated. Um, fill this in and change what? The, change the details afterwards. What? And then so uh, the advisor will, will received it into a trust account or something, and then it was. I think it was caught before it happened. Um, oh, but yeah. My God! Yeah, right. Okay. So, 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 bar you know, criminal behaviour, theft, right? Um, so, a, a, a PI will come in most of the time. So, there's always exclusions on on PI insurance as well. So, okay. there's certain things that won't be covered. Um, like there's no cover for fines and penalties. So, you know, if ASIC was to fine you. There's generally no PI right. cover, uh, which they can only do for misleading or deceptive conduct, by the way. ASIC doesn't have the power to fine for anything. It's just that particular one. Okay. Um, uh, some other things that are excluded, if you have assumed liability under contract, so um, this is where you've got to be really careful. If you're in a contract, you say that you're responsible for something that you're actually not responsible for at law, and so you assume a contractual obligation to indemnify somebody, um, your PR insurance usually won't cover that either. So what's in, how, how would that happen? It probably doesn't happen in financial advice as much because there's all this joint and several liability going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and so everybody is actually liable for the full amount at law. Um, right. So as between licensees and authorised representatives, mm. it, it generally wouldn't happen. Um, if right. you were to say to the client, look, you know, if the product goes belly up... <laughs> I'll reimburse you, <laughs> right? You don't have that liability at law. <laughs> right. And your PI insurer is not going to pay for that. Right. <laughs> so if some advisor is dumb enough to say, oh, I guarantee that nothing will ever go bad. Yep. Here's my signature sign here. We've got this individual contract. Yeah. Okay, so okay. Something like that, yeah. Right, I mean, right, I've right, never right. personally seen somebody no. guarantee a product like that, no. but that's not to say that it wouldn't ever happen. No, no, no. Even if it was just verbal, you know, like it's perfectly safe, nothing's going to happen, right? You could right. argue that there was an implied contract. Correct. Okay. Um, difficult to evidence, right, if it's all verbal. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that things get said a lot more than they get written down uh, when offering assurances and clients are asking questions. Um, is Have you heard anything to that end uh, about a push to record all conversations? Is, is, is that something that you're hearing? Um, I haven't specifically heard people sort of suggesting that all conversations should be recorded, but certainly I've had people asking me more about how you go about recording conversations and what the rules are. Um, I know I have I have heard around the traps that uh, people record for monitoring and training purposes, but right. often they're actually not, right. <laughs> uh, or nobody listens to them. Right. Um, oh, right. So uh, that that's anecdotally, it's what I've heard. Um, I don't have any sort of specific examples, but um, I mean, obviously, if you're actually going to the effort of recording conversations, I would suggest that it is a good idea that somebody periodically reviews at least a sample of them to check what's going on. Sure. Um, and uh, and if you're not recording them, well, I guess it depends on. Who's talking to who? Um, so let's say in, in, a, in a client meeting, the advisor and the client, uh, and it, because you, you were mentioning before how I'm sure it happens that uh, 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 someone's going to promise something that never materialises. Um, to get around that, you could have all, all conversations, all meetings recorded. Yeah, you could. Um, is there any legal issues there? You, you need their sign-off from the client or something like that? Uh, there are rules about when you can record conversations. Can you record a phone call? 
Uh, you can record phone calls. The, there's quite complicated rules about that. So, I mean, right. if you've ever called a call centre and you get that recorded message about mm. these calls are recorded for training and monitoring purposes, yeah, that's one of the things that you have to do to actually comply with all the, the rules and regulations around recording calls. Yeah, um, I would suggest that if you were going to record client meetings, mm-hmm. um, the easiest thing to do would be just to say to the client, "Look, you know, I'm going to take a recording of this phone co- of this, this conversation. Mm. Do you mind? Um, it's for my file, and it just means that you know I'm not going to miss anything that you've told me that's important." to your particular circumstances. I actually think that's a fantastic idea because one of the biggest issues I see with licensees right now and one of the biggest bugbears that ASIC has as well is record keeping. Um, so many advisors record keeping is just not up to scratch. If you were recording all your calls and all your conversations with your client with their consent, mm. you'd never have a question mark over what happened in this meeting and you're looking at a file note going, but I know that they spoke to me about X and I haven't written it down. Where's my evidence? And then you mm. get into an argument with the regulator and it's your word against what's right. on the file. Right. If you had a recording, you'd be able to listen to the recording and go, there, that's where they told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from a record keeping perspective, I actually think that that's a great idea uh, for completeness of records. Yeah, right. I, 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 you, you, do you ever spend any time on um, calling somewhere and they stick you on a, in a wait list or whatever, right? And you get that boring music and then... <laughs> and then whatever their jingle is. Yeah, oh my God, it drives me crazy. <laughs> I remember back when I used to work in power planning, I had to call everyone. And then uh, one, one time... Uh, the person on the phone goes, blah, 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 we're just going to record this conversation. Is that okay with you? I was like, no. <laughs> just, <laughs> no. <laughs> and they're like, oh. what? <laughs> what? And I was like, yeah, I do not give permission to this phone call to be recorded. <laughs> and then and then she goes, oh, well, um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I do. <laughs> That's really bad training. Yeah. Um, you, do, you do have to ask uh, and tell them that you're going to do that and you're supposed to be able to opt out. Yeah. Um, well, and, I know. And, I tried. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> she goes, I'm not talking to you. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> They're not training their people on how to actually opt people out. It's not a meaningful opt out because then you have to consent to the call being recorded <laughs> so that you can actually achieve whatever it is that you've called them to achieve. Totally. Uh, and if you called your bank to resolve, you know, a disputed transaction, transaction or something, you don't really have the option of not calling them. Exactly. So, so you're going to say yes. That's not, that's not an effective opt-out. I know. It, it, yeah. It, it, I mean, that might be a really good... So what do you see is the optimal um, situation for an advisor? Like, do you see financial advisors out there that are doing really well in this self-licensed space? Um, i trying to think about who I sort of know in this space. A lot of the people that we sort of deal with are what you would probably call sort of small to medium-sized dealer groups. But we do have, um, like we get people come to us for licensing who are individual um, financial advisors or small businesses of financial advisors who want to get a license and go out and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily have a lot of ongoing contact with those people in the first couple of years. Sure. um, Because they either don't have a lot of legal requirements. Yeah. um, Or they're running quite lean. Um, yeah. But as far as I'm aware, they're all doing just fine. Yep. Um, they've not had any major problems. Yep. Uh, if they'd had any major problems, I'm assuming they would have called me. Yeah, uh, right. So the <laughs> fact that you know less is a good indication. That's right. Yeah. So they, they've not run into any major legal hurdles or, or compliance issues. Right. Um, because otherwise that's when people start coming back and asking questions. Hey, you know, like my financials don't stack up anymore. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting those questions from those businesses. So... Uh, I don't have any visibility of their financial outcomes, obviously, totally. but they're not in trouble. Like they, They've not had compliance issues. And are you getting small dealer groups who are asking around licensing or are you getting more questions around uh, individual self-licensing? Mostly it's um, individual self-licensing. Right. Um, we don't get a lot of people coming to do licensing who want to set up a dealer group. Right. We have some clients who are small dealer groups who've already got their own licenses. What do you think uh, about anyone who's listening at the moment? Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll make it really specific. A lot of people want to turn XY advisor into a dealer group. <laughs> And we've fought, we've fought it tooth and nail, um, and I don't think we're going to do it, but a lot of people suggest that we do. Um, can you confirm for me that that is a bad idea? <laughs> <laughs> and Look, for, one, like, for, for, like, so that it gets buried and I never have to defend it again. I would hazard a guess that if you decide to turn XY Advisor into a dealer group, that you won't have time to do these podcasts anymore. Bingo. Heard it here, people. <laughs> don't leave me alone. 
<laughs> that's um, that's not to suggest that it's a bad idea for everybody. Sure. But you've got to understand what you're getting into. Mm. Um, and if you're going to run a small dealer group, and by by small dealer group, I mean not a closed group of, of people who jointly own the licensee and have their own satellite businesses off it. But if you're going to open it to business, to everybody, you've got to understand what's involved in the compliance for that. And the more advisors you add on, the more complicated that compliance gets because as a licensee, you've got to monitor and supervise them all. You can't just yeah. say, here's your authorization, go forth and be fruitful. Mm-hmm. Um, you've actually then got to go back and check that the advice that they're giving is okay. And that's much easier in a small collaborative sort of closed group. Um, you can even peer review each other's work and just get an external advisor in when, when needed to provide extra compliance boost. But if you're actually supervising multiple businesses, the scale of that is immediately bigger and you immediately need dedicated compliance resources to do that. Um, four friends can pass their advice around amongst each other and say, what do you think of this? Mm. Is it okay? Mm. Um But as soon as you've added on multiple businesses, you need a dedicated resource to go and do all the file reviews, to do the annual or biannual compliance and everything, audits, whatever. And so there's different levels. uh, Is that what you're suggesting? So if a a self-licensed one uh, person, you know, maybe with a handful of employees, they have a certain uh, legislation requirement compared to once as soon as there's more and it's a small dealer group from, say, five. And then does it then step up again once it hits, say, 20? The legal obligation is the same. Oh, it's right. the practical implications of it that changes. So if you're running a single office and everybody is in your office together, um, your monitoring and supervision obligations you can meet um, just by turning up to the office every day, right? right? Because you collaborate and you talk. And if you're not sure about the advice you're giving, you'll go and sanity check it with a peer or or, or somebody who's more sophisticated. Normal course of business. Yep, that's right. Yep. So a lot of your monitoring and supervision can get done in the course of a normal day. Mm. Um, and so then you might just do spot checks randomly every now and then. Sure. Um, but if you start setting up a dealer group with additional businesses, those businesses are not always in the same location and, and they won't be in your office. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have one in Brisbane, you could have one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, one in Perth. Um, you know, and then you've got this question of, well, how do you supervise those people? You don't, you can't see every day what they're doing. Well, what is the requirement? Because uh, I think most dealer groups are the same. You probably see your BDM once every quarter or something like that. Yeah. So the obligation is basically that you've got to monitor and supervise your representatives um, and you've got to ensure that they comply with the financial services laws. So that's really the obligations that we're talking about. Yeah. Now, that's obviously a lot easier to do in a small office. Um, and, and yes, you're right, in dealer groups, you'd only set your BDM once a month or so ever. Yeah. Um, but those businesses also have usually quite complex compliance plans. And so that involves, um, it might involve, uh, the, there's power planning levels that have to be met or there's there's pre-vet and everyone's on pre-vet either permanently <laughs> or for a certain <laughs> period of time, or you get put back to pre-vet if your advice doesn't meet certain standards. And there'll be annual audits that are conducted in-house and then there might be an external audit that's conducted. It's crazy, then, isn't it? Yeah. So there's all these <sighs> layers of compliance in those bigger businesses, right? Because they have to do all these different things to be able to keep their finger on the pulse in all these different locations. Uh, so it's much, much different to having a closed group where there's a bunch of you operating from shared office premises or even where you've got a closed group where you might not operate from the same premises but you're all in business together and you all depend on each other. Yeah. Um, and so even though you might not be sharing physical space, you'll tend to sort of tic-tac a little bit in terms of sanity checking the advice that you're giving if you're not sure and reaching out for support and you can still shuffle things around for peer review and file checks. Yeah. Um, but the, the level of compliance resources and the structure that you need to your compliance program once you start having multiple businesses in multiple locations is much, much higher burden. Right. No, that makes sense. What, what, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in financial services that, um, first of all, give you the heebie-jeebies and then, second of all, that you think are promising? So what, 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 are, some, what are some trends that you're liking and you're disliking? Uh, at a at a regulatory level or at a, an advice at, level, at, anything, anything. <laughs> um, this concept that we can make the individual advisor um, liable and responsible for absolutely everything, without any acknowledgement for the role played by the culture within which they are forced to operate, um, makes me distinctly uncomfortable. So we have a code of ethics coming in um, and we've we've already got best interest duty, which applies to the advisor at, at the bottom level. Um, we've still got some institutions who remain unnamed, going back to the Royal Commission saying it wasn't our fault, it was their fault. Um, 
And I'm not saying that advisors shouldn't be ethical. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a code of ethics. And I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have their own obligations. But what I'm saying is that I'm seeing a distinct lack of um, realistic view on the practical realities for an advisor um, working within a culture that has certain limitations and expectations. Um, fundamentally, I think that uh, large institutions are conflicted even without conflicted remuneration. Take the remuneration out of it, you're left with the employment relationship. Sure. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> t- 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 toe the party line or you're out of a job, right? Um, so taking the money out of it doesn't really make a difference. The, the money's still in it. It's just that it's the salary. And yes, the salary can still motivate you to do the wrong thing. Um, we all have bills to pay. Mm. So, so that trend, that this idea that we can make the individual advisor wholly and solely responsible and it will be a cure-all for all the regulatory ills in the industry it makes me very uncomfortable. I just think that that's a fallacy um, and it's a very shallow view of the problems facing Who, the industry. From what angle is that that message coming from? Because it's clearly uh, it clearly needs to be re-examined. Oh, I think we, we've seen it at various different levels. I, I've seen it... Um, in the way that different financial planners have been handled with their audits uh, and reports to ASIC. Right. Um, I've seen it um, to some degree uh, from the regulator. ASIC um, yep, itself, yep. Yeah, um, in terms of their, their willingness to accept that financial advisors operate within these constraints. There seems to be a little bit of disdain from them towards financial advisors. Uh, on their website and things like that, they would just talk about chunky advisors for no reason you're like what, what why is this why is this even a topic what, what are you are you are you um, familiar with the relationship between ASIC and advisors yeah yes uh, I am so um, <laughs> what can we do to help that because it's a genuine it's a genuine concern that we have I feel like so even though you know I'm a part of XY I've never had a chance to speak to them and I, I just think that's insane uh, there's there has to be a better way for us to communicate with with the regular and i understand mm. all the limitations that they have they only have so many people their budget is only a certain size there's only so much that they can do and i completely understand that um what do you think we can do because i don't i don't just want to leave it at that mm. that 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 is that is a, a genuine problem that needs to be fixed and i i'm not saying that uh, asic is wrong what i'm saying is asic don't understand what it's like to be on the coal front, sort of extrapolating what, what you're saying. And I think probably individuals within there understand that, but as almost like as a public facing policy, there is somewhat uh, of, of, a, of a negative skew and, and, and there has been bad advice and there has been bad advisors and there has been bad practices. Um, and, and uh, to a certain extent, a lot of these, um, things that have come in haven't helped. Anything. I think I think FOFO helped. I think stripping out commissions within investments really helped. I genuinely think that. Um, but a lot of these other things uh, uh, just make more hoops to jump through in order to achieve the same outcome that the dealer group or whatever wanted to achieve, or even or even you know s- self licensed independent advisors mm. that you know make made more money doing something a certain way. Everyone just jumps through these hoops. And, and I think probably if I was to look at it objectively, what it looks like is ASIC is tr- sees a problem. They're trying to solve a problem. The way that they go about solving the problem doesn't work and it's probably annoying them. I think that's probably a big part of the irritation. I think they're trying to cure symptoms. Yeah, okay. And, and not, not the underlying root cause of the problem. Yeah. Um, and uh, fundamentally, I think the root cause of the problem is cultural. And, totally. and and to some degree, I think that they recognise that, right? But how do you um, how do you fix that? it? Right, culture is a really hard thing to Can fix. Can we brainstorm? I'm, I'm willing to. <laughs> I'm willing to. How do you fix culture? How do you fix culture? You could literally fire everyone in a company. The, uh, well, yeah, that is one way. As an extreme measure, yeah. 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 So firing everyone <laughs> in a company scratch. and then rehiring. Um, you could. Uh, you oh, you could almost train ASIC uh, employees like CIA agents to then infiltrate all of the different <laughs> financial 
<laughs> service companies <laughs> that are out there until eventually they, you know, with really good sort of manipulation skills and interpersonal and then they can convince everyone them around them to act like saints. I mean, I, I guess I'm putting forward these ridiculous <laughs> ideas because how do you solve it? How do you solve culture? Uh, it is really hard. Um, and I'm not suggesting that I have the holy grail answer mm. to that. Uh, I guess some answers are, look, you know, I do support a code of ethics. Uh, I think that a, a code of ethics is a, a fundamentally really good idea if um, if financial advisors want to be a profession. Yeah. Um, I think that training is part of it, but is this idea that everybody has to have be like degree qualified? I'm not sure if that's... Well, to that, I've seen some really good research um, by advisor ratings, which showed a clear correlation between um, higher education equal less um, less reports to ASIC mm-hmm. and uh, to the regulators. So it certainly may be part of it. Yeah, um, but you've got to also consider that the in-house training that advisors get plays a part um, in the culture as well. Um, yeah, in definitely. Terms of, God, yes. Right. Oh, of course. So one common problem that we'll see is that people who've come out of an institution think that the way that they've been trained to do something is the only way to mm. do the thing. And we have yeah. to actually say to them, well, actually what you were trained to do is meant to address this obligation. Mm. This obligation can be dealt with in many ways. Mm. That's one of them. Here's some other ways. Um, yeah. and if you are taught to do a thing... Um, without understanding what the obligation is that underpins that uh, or, how, or how the thing that you're taught to do connects with the obligation, uh, you come away with a very limited understanding of what it is that you're supposed to do. You've essentially wrote, learned how to do something yes. without having any deeper understanding of the issue and then being able to apply your understanding to a different situation and come up with a different solution. Now, we see uh, rote training when we do rote training for people, we are doing rote training for people who are um, distributing financial services products, particularly insurance, um, at the absolute coalface of distribution. So we're talking about strata managers who are selling insurance or travel agents who are selling insurance. Right? These are people who are only doing financial services as a small adjunct to their business. And so we rote train them on what we need them to do mm. and then we limit what they can do. Mm. Now, when you... Think about that, and then you think about the idea of rote training financial advisors to deal with their obligations in a particular way. You can kind of see that that's a preposterous way <laughs> to train somebody who is supposed to be a expert An professional. Advisor. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Somebody that a client comes to to rely on for a particular piece of investment advice or insurance advice, and they've been rote trained to do things in a particular way. So I think we need deeper understanding of what the obligations are. So being degree qualified is a really good start, right? But Mm. if you go and do a degree in accounting or um, business or whatever it is that might be relevant to qualify under the the new regime, that's still not going to teach you anything particular about your financial services obligations. We have RG146 training, um, but that's apparently not really working either because all these people are RG146 trained. They've all done their diploma of financial services. They're advising retail clients. So that's obviously not communicating to them about their obligations either. So I think there's, there's another training piece in there that's missing because we simply should not be rote teaching these people to do things. Um, you know, just fill in the SOA like this. Of course well, not. No, like you, you actually need your advisor to understand how the statement of advice template works, Yeah. understand what the objective is of each part of that document and then understand how to customise that for a particular client. Stop giving drop-downs of lists of things to choose from from, for objectives. How can you possibly accurately describe the client's objectives or the strategy for them if you're using drop-down lists? (laughs) Like this, <laughs> we're, we're, we we want financial. Because Jamie, it fills out <laughs> half the SOA when I do so. For God's sake, <laughs> we want financial advisors to be professionals. Yeah, but we're. But tri- so much of it is 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 this uh, in the SOA, right? So much is this paperwork and this compliance. Yeah, well, I have views about SOAs too. <laughs> and 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 then so what it is 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 I think um, everyone's trying to fix the issue by a top down pressure of forcing people to do things, but all it is is, is just taking up advisors' time, Absolutely. really. And, and, and the end result is the same. Um, I, I think we could talk about this literally <laughs> all day, but out of respect for your time, and it is Friday afternoon, uh, we'll wrap it up. Is it, it, how, how can people go about 
um, finding more about you or, or your company and what it is that you do? Yeah, okay. So we're The Fold Legal um, and you can find us at thefoldlegal.com.au. Yep. Um, very easy. That's the fold, like folding a piece of paper. I get asked that a bit. <laughs> um, and uh, we provide support to um, AFS and credit licensees in uh, the regulatory and licensing space. So you can find out what we do on our website. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, My pleasure. Really uh, great um, well, time learning about this sort of stuff, which I know a lot of people are, are bored to death of. <laughs> but I just found myself, I was like, I'm never going to stop if I don't. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. No, my pleasure. Thank Bye. you. Bye.